stage two fuel load is complete. Stage two lock load has started.
stage one engine chill has started. Stage one, fuel load is complete. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Dragon is on internal tower. Falcon 9 propellant tanks are pressurizing for Stromback retract. Strombeck is retracting. Dragon is in terminal count. Stage one locks load is complete.
stage two lock load is complete. Dragon is in auto idle. Ground gas close as it's starting. Dragon FD is in countdown. FDS is armed. Falcon 9 is a startup and it's now controlling. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds, all for one, crew one for all. T minus 15 seconds. Okay, nine is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. Ignition. Lift off. Vehicles pitching downrange. M one E propulsion is nominal. Power and telemetry nominal. Stage one, throttle down. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Max Q. Stage one, throttle up. MVAC engine chill started. Stage one, throttle down. And we have Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Well, like acquisition of signal. In the ignition.
Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Stage one FTS is saved. Stage two FTS is saved. Stage two in terminal guidance.
MVAC shut down. Dragon SpaceX, nominal orb insertion. Launch escape system is disarmed. Expected loss of signal, keep an eye Acquisition of signal in Newfoundland. Dragon separation confirmed. Dragon separation confirmed.
Countdown 1 is unmerged. Acquisition of signal, go on heli.
Discovery clears the tower. Discovery, go and throttle up. Discovery, Roger, go for deploy. Thanks to you. Thanks to everybody in the shuttle program. The crew is go for launch. It has been an incredible day with the launch of Crew-1 from Kennedy Space Center, NASA's first official long duration mission for our commercial crew program. So exciting, what an amazing day. We watched the crew as they suited up. We watched them ingress on Crew Dragon. We had an on-time liftoff at 7.27 p.m. Eastern time. Stage one came back and landed back uh, on Just Read the Instructions. We got confirmation of Dragon separation as well as nose cone deploy. Yes, nose cone deploy came back clear and we also had some good forward uh, Draco checkouts. So all good news there as the crew continues on the way to the International Space Station. And as we said, the mission has only just begun. Right now, NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi are flying free inside Dragon after that successful separation from Falcon 9. And now we've got about 27 hours until they arrive at the space station, and we'll be here with you for the entire trip. Immediately after the Dragon spacecraft separated from Falcon 9, it began what we call the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. During this phase, Dragon is configured for on-orbit operations. The phase begins after separation of Dragon from Falcon 9 and ends with the completion of the final co-elliptic burn. Our initial orbit today is 210 kilometers by 190 kilometers with those values representing the perigee and the apogee of the orbit or the lowest and the highest point over the Earth. That means that the orbit isn't a perfect circle but more like a very slight ellipse. Dragon SpaceX, next burn is for your displays and have some more words on TCS. Okay, and SpaceX uh, Dragon is ready to copy. Okay, it looks like during activation, Loop Alpha had a pressure spike, which caused Fitter to trip and fill over to Loop Bravo. Uh, however, we, we do believe that Loop Alpha is healthy, and we're troubleshooting to understand, uh, you know, what our plan to recovery is. However, we are go for the burn in the current TCS configuration. Okay, SpaceX Dragon copies. Uh, we had a pressure spike on Alpha, swap, fitter swap to Bravo, and you do think Alpha is heavy or uh, is healthy, and uh, you'll get us more words later on how we'll get it back, and we are go for the burn coming up uh, in approximately 19 minutes. Yeah, good copy on TCS. Uh, regarding the go for the burn, we're still assessing our overall go for the vehicle. However, TCS uh, is in an acceptable configuration. Okay, yeah, Dragon copies. And we are also uh, still assessing cabin environment, and I expect to give you some more words on that shortly for suit offing. Dragon copies. So those were words from the from the core, the crew operations and resources engineer here in Hawthorne, to our crew aboard Crew Dragon. They did uh, have an issue with the TCS or the thermal control system, um, and you heard another acronym in there, the FITTER. That's the fault detection and isolation. It's an automated system to respond to any issues that arise. Uh, there was a pressure pump spike on a pump in the thermal control system, uh, and Dragon auto switched to Bravo. We do have. Two Two fault tolerance on Crew Dragon, and the flight controllers still believe that the pump that had a pressure spike is functional. 
But the key thing is that we are still continue to go with the nominal burn plan. So over the next 27 hours, Dragon will execute a series of burns, which will gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the station. There are five major burns or firing of the Draco thrusters on Dragon that will bring the spacecraft close to station before we begin final approach maneuvers. The first, which you may have heard them discuss, is the phase burn. This is performed at the first apogee or the highest point of the initial orbit, and it raises Dragon's perigee or its lowest point to a higher altitude. The next burn, which is based on what our orbital data shows us, is the boost burn, which raises Dragon's orbit until its, a, until its orbit reaches an altitude of just 10 kilometers lower than the space station. Followed soon after the followed soon after by the close co-elliptic burn to place Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station. This means that the crew will be about 10 kilometers lower than the station during their entire orbit around the Earth. The fourth maneuver is the transfer burn where we're raising Dragon's apogee or the highest point of its orbit to just two and a half kilometers below station. And then we round everything out with a final co-elliptic burn to once again maintain a constant orbit beneath station, this time just two and a half kilometers kilometers below. And then we'll get into the approach initiation and final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the space station. This is also when we start integrated operations between the Dragon control team here in Hawthorne and the space station flight controllers in Mission Control Houston. The teams will transition to integrated operations roughly 45 minutes prior to approach initiation. During the approach, SpaceX flight controllers will work in tandem with the NASA team in Houston to activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including bidirectional, bidirectional communications with the station using the C2V2 system, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles, and sets up a data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to the ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. They'll also maneuver over Dragon to the proper altitude and initialize the navigation sensors used for the methodical approach to station. Tomorrow at approximately 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, Draco thrusters on Dragon will fire for the approach initiation burn when Dragon is about two and a half kilometers below station and just about seven kilometers behind it. This will swing Dragon up until it's about 400 meters directly below the station. This maneuver will also move Dragon inside one of the two safety zones around the station that requires a set of go-no-go -no -go poles with the different control teams. The first zone is called the approach ellipsoid, which is an imaginary shape measured measuring four by two by two kilometers, essentially a large three-dimensional oval. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside of this ellipsoid, referred to by the teams as the AE, it is configured to be on what is known as a 24-hour safe trajectory. This means that if Dragon lost all control to its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its orbital path would take it inside of the approach ellipsoid. And once Dragon arrives at 400 meters below station, it will be at waypoint zero, the first checkpoint during our approach. The vehicle can hold at 400 meters or continue on if all systems check out to approach to waypoint one. By this point, the teams will do a go, no go for Dragon to move inside the keepout sphere, another zone that consists of an imaginary sphere around station with a radius of 200 meters. It gives us another chance to confirm all the guidance, navigation, and control systems are working correctly on Dragon before moving closer to station. And it carries a requirement similar to the AE that if Dragon's orbital trajectory would not bring it inside Dragon that SpaceX for seat offing. And go ahead for seat offing. Okay, at this time, uh, cabin environments are looking good. So we can give you go for 4.012 and 4.300 for suit offing, and we are reconfiguring cameras now. Okay, Dragon copies. We are go for 4.012, 4.300, and you're reconfiguring cameras. And then uh, let's just—I want to confirm one more time on uh, the thermal loop caution or warning. Uh, we are good that that uh, you do expect to clear both of those. Clear that caution. That's affirmative, yeah. Uh, we're currently working on just cleaning up fitter. The response that occurred was both Loop Alpha and Bravo. They both saw the spike. 
which resulted both of them in tripping fitter, and then we filled over to basically a min four. Min okay, which copy, uh, you're cleaning up fitter right now. And so MS-1 and pilot will be getting out of their seats and starting the uh, suit docking. All right, a lot there from Crew Dragon and the Corps. And Dragon SpaceX, I copied your last call. We were in a teacher's handover. Have some more words on procedure deltas. Okay, go ahead for procedure deltas. On 4.012, note that the large outer bags to dispose the comfort garments are with the suit storage bags in location 17. And on 4.300, note that the waste duffel is already installed and steps 1.2 and 1.3 are complete. Okay, we copy uh, large outer bags are with the suits and the waste uh, bag is already installed. Good read back and I'll keep you posted as we clean up the TCS. Drag cups. Hearing it directly from the astronauts themselves. They are go to doff their suits. They've had them on for quite a while today, and they are able to get into some more comfortable clothes. Um, and so, as you heard, they're also con reconfiguring the cameras inside Crew Dragon to give them a little bit of privacy up there on orbit, as well as the thermal control system. They're working at clearing those issues, but everything so far looking good for Dragon. Dragon's move from waypoint zero to waypoint one will swing it up and out in front of the station, pausing at a distance of approximately 220 meters. At this point, it will be on what we call the docking access, which essentially means that it's directly in front of the docking port. The crew is headed to the forwardmost port on the International Space Station, the Node 2 forward port. That is where Dragon docked for both our demonstration missions and where one of the two international docking adapters is located. These were installed for new commercial spacecraft flights and any other future spacecraft that also use the international docking standard. And once Dragon is only 20 meters away at waypoint two, the spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the docking adapter. Dragon will then fly in and make contact with the IDA, giving us what we call soft capture. The soft capture ring then retracts until sensors indicate it's time for hooks to drive in place to give us a hard capture and firmly secure Dragon to station. And then it's time for leak checks and hatch opening, which is currently timeline to come about two Two hours following docking. So we have a lot of action to cover for the next 27 and a half hours. Let's head down to Mission Control Houston and check back in with Shaniqua Vereen to get a rundown of all the work being done on the station to prepare for Dragon's arrival. Shaniqua? Thanks, Jesse. A lot of work has been done on the space station before we got to this day to make sure we're launching Dragon and this new crew to a fully functioning orbital laboratory. Several hours before the crew boarded Dragon, the space station team did their own go-no-go -no -go poll. There are several key systems we have to ensure are functioning properly before NASA can give a go for launch. One of the more obvious is making sure our life support systems are functioning normally. This includes the ability to turn water into oxygen for the for the astronauts to breathe, the ability to remove carbon dioxide exhaled by station crew into the atmosphere, and our water recovery system, which is now able to recycle about 90% of the water we send to station. We have redundant or backup systems on both the U.S. and Russian segments on the station, just in case we need to take something offline for repairs. The teams also made sure that we're no, there were no faults or issues with the station's power or cooling systems. The station's massive solar arrays generate electricity for all the hardware we have on board. All those electronics inevitably generate heat. We utilize an active cooling system using ammonia and, re and radiators to keep everything running at a stable temperature. We also work with our Russian counterparts to ensure both means of controlling the station's attitude or Dragon which way it's pointing are fully functional. On the U.S. side, we have large gyroscopes spinning in the station's truss that are used to stabilize and orient the station hey, on a day-to-day -day basis. On the Russian okay, segment, the we have large thrusters that can be uh, called no upon to use time. fuel stored on board to, main, to maintain uh, to the station's the attitude. Alerts ahead of the burn. OK, 
Okay, we copy. Uh, you're still working the TCS issue. Okay, good copy. However, that's not a blocker. And say that again. Yeah, copy on the TCS issue. However, that is not a blocker to the burn. And we copy that. using both once it's time for Dragon to dock, switching to Russian thrusters in the final phases of approach, which can respond faster to any forces felt by station from Dragon's thruster, thrusters, and then back to gyroscopes, which are normally smooth, normally smoother and ensure Dragon's docking hooks can deploy successfully. Right now, the Expedition 64 crew aboard the station is still asleep, but they're scheduled to wake up at midnight here in Houston, 6 a.m. GMT on Sunday to prepare, on Monday to prepare for the Space SpaceX, this is the crew of billions on the cabin, Mike Thompson. NASA astronaut and Expedition 64 flight engineer, Kate Hello, Rubin, Victor, will be monitoring the Dragon's approach. Hello, on the cabin, Mike. How's it going, Jay? Great to hear your voice. Likewise. We're hearing good calls from the court on Dragon to Ground. But as I was stating, flight engineer Kate Rubens will be monitoring Dragon's approach using special software to make sure Dragon is flying in the expected areas, and she will be on standby to help in any abort scenarios. Once docked, she'll be primed for setting up the hardware on the station side to get ready for hatch opening and pre-positioning some ducting that we'll use to integrate Dragon's atmosphere with the rest of the station. So a lot of work done already, and the station team Dragon remains SpaceX ready for Dragon for to arrive status. in just a, in just about 27 and a half hours. For now, back over to Jesse and Leah to make 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 take us through the yeah, next steps for Dragon. Yeah, we are going to take commands to uh, clear the fault flag on Loop Bravo and then loop alpha, and that should put both loops running at half speed. Thanks, Shaniqua. Uh, we are- Okay, you're gonna clear the fault on Bravo, then alpha, then they should both be running at half speed uh, for nominal ops. Good copy, and we're putting that in work now. Dragon. And it sounds like they were discussing those TCS thermal control system issues. They are putting both Loop A and Loop Bravo, Loop B, at 50% so that they can run nominal operations. But looks like we are getting to ready to move into the phase burn. Yes, we are. So we're waiting for Dragon to move into that phase burn. As we mentioned earlier, there are five major burns where Draco thrusters will ignite and bring the spacecraft close to the station before we begin final approach maneuvers. Our initial orbit after Dragon separated from Falcon 9 was 210 by 190 kilometers. Those values represent the or 
the orbit apogee, or the highest point over the Earth, and the perigee, or the lowest point over the Earth. That means that the orbit is in a perfect circle, and we're going to see Dragon raise its orbit using the Draco thrusters over the coming hours as it chases down the space station. So as we mentioned, the first major burn is the phase burn, which is performed at the first apogee of the initial orbit and raises Dragon's... Dragon SpaceX settling burns have started. Just a reminder to minimize any dynamic movements during the burn, but okay to continue suit offing. Okay, Dragon copies, we are into the settling burns and uh, we'll go on minimize movement during the actual burn. And still preparing for that burn, but it'll raise Dragon's perigee, the lowest point of its orbit, to a higher altitude. This burn will use the Draco thrusters located on the forward bulkhead. That's the very top of Dragon under the nose cone, which is now deployed. It'll also use the thrusters around the service section or the lower part of the Dragon capsule. The thrusters located on the bulkhead are primarily used for these delta velocity burns, which will gradually raise Dragon's orbit over the coming hours. Dragon SpaceX for TCS. And go ahead for TCS. We have uh, cleared the alerts and Loop Alpha is back up, uh, looking nominal right now. We're gonna continue to monitor, but we are going to clear the alerts on the board. Okay, Loop. Loop Alpha is up, we see that, uh, both are at half speed, and you're going to clear the alerts off the board. Good read back. Yeah, and this is the nominal configuration. And drug cups. And great news from the core crew operations. And, and Dragon SpaceX, just for timeline awareness, burn is in about just under one minute. And copy that, we see it starts in uh, 40 seconds. Hey, and just for your awareness, both uh, MS-1 and Pilot are out of their suits and they're getting them strapped into their seats this time. Copy all. And the phase burn should begin in just a few seconds from now. As you heard, the crew are still doffing their suits. They're allowed to continue moving around the capsule as long as they don't impart any forces on the capsule itself. Additionally, uh, great news that the TCS thermal control system is in a nominal configuration as they suspected that pump is still functional. And so Crew Dragon continues its journey to the International Space Station. Looking good. Yeah. Now, in addition to those four bulkhead Draco thrusters that Leah was mentioning earlier, there are 12 more Dracos in the service section, which is the area along the lower part of the Dragon capsule. These will be used in every burn and are primarily there to help maintain Dragon's altitude, which is especially important when doing the finely tuned approach into docking. They can also be used for smaller transitional maneuvers as well. And we're just waiting for confirmation of that phase burn. The view on the right side of your screen here is pretty impressive, I have to say. That's the uh, International Space Station. That's from the International Space Station. It's solar rays specifically, and it's currently flying, let's see here, over the South Pacific Ocean, about 267 statute miles above Earth. So. Crew Dragon is uh, continuing its pursuit of the International Space Station, and that's where you can find it right now. Still awaiting confirmation of the beginning of the phase burn. And actually, phase burn has begun. We are a minute underway, so good news there. And it should last about nine and a half minutes, as we mentioned, raising the perigee or the lowest point of Dragon's current orbit to a higher altitude.
got a lot of milestones coming up. You know, there were a lot in the countdown to the mission, but there is still a lot to go as it continues its approach to the space station. The next really major milestone comes at 1.10 a.m. Pacific time. Oh, and we're getting words that the burn is proceeding nominally, so that's good. Uh, but tomorrow morning, ex actually, it'll be uh, 4.10 a.m. Pacific time, or Eastern time, the Crew Dragon crew will get some much needed shut eye. It's been a long day for them. Um, and we try not to really do any burns while they're asleep. We want to give them the opportunity to sleep because those burns, you know, might be a little bit loud, might wake them up. So uh, the next burn will be the boost burn. That won't come until 8.20 a.m. Pacific or 11.20 a.m. Eastern time. So those are just a couple of the things we can look forward to on Dragon's journey to the International Space Station. As we mentioned, though, those are just two of the five burns. We'll also have the close burn. That comes uh, at 9.02 a.m. Pacific, 12.02 p.m. Eastern. The transfer burn at 2.45 Pacific and 5.45 Eastern. And then the co-elliptic burn. Once these burns, these major burns are complete, we'll be done with the rendezvous phase. Um, and then we'll move into the approach initiation phase. So as we mentioned, uh, we are in the phase burn right now. We're getting good information that uh, phase burn is proceeding nominally. It's about a nine and a half minute burn. And afterward, uh, that's actually raising Dragon's perigee, the lowest part of its orbit, as we mentioned. And that'll put us in place for the boost burn. The boost burn uh, will not take place until tomorrow morning when the astronauts are starting to wake up. They might not be awake just yet. Uh, and after the boost burn, which will raise the apogee or the highest point of Dragon's orbit to 10 kilometers lower than the station, uh, that will we will find the closed co-elliptic burn. That's about 45 minutes after the boost burn, and it'll put Dragon's orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station. That means that 10 kilometer orbit below station will be where Dragon stays around the Earth. Afterward, we have the transfer burn. That will adjust Dragon's apogee, the highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers lower than the station orbit. And then the final co-elliptic burn, about 45 minutes after the transfer burn, putting Dragon into an orbit co-elliptic with the station about 2.5 kilometers below it the entire way around the Earth. As we mentioned after that, the rendezvous is complete and uh, will still be about 30 kilometers behind the station at that time. We'll have the approach initiation burn afterward. This, as we mentioned, is beginning that approach phase. Yeah, and all of these burns, uh, there's several different burns. They're all doing a different thing for Dragon, but basically it's a very precise maneuver to get to the station. It's very important to make sure that we get there slowly and steadily and make our way right in front of the docking port. Um, so every single one of these burns is extremely important and extremely precise. Absolutely. And I think it's almost uh, dinner time. Yeah, I think they're getting ready for a meal coming up in just about um, a few minutes here, about 12 minutes at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. The crew will have their first meal on board Dragon, and they have enough food on board Dragon for 12 meals each uh, along with snacks uh, for the trip up. And these are MREs or meals ready to eat. They're essentially prepackaged meals ready for consumption without any heating or additional uh, ingredients. And they also have uh, uh, 55 liters or about 14.5 gallons of water with them. Yeah, and these are a little bit different. Actually, they might be a, a good bit different from their food that they can expect on the International Space Station. MREs, like you said, meals ready to eat. They don't require any work, which sounds like a dream sometimes to me <laughs> personally. I love that kind of food. No cooking. <laughs> but they just, uh, they just have to open the package and they can eat their dinner. Whereas on the International Space Station, we have thermostabilized food for some of the options. And uh, the astronauts can... There's a small nozzle on each package, and they can plug that into a water source, which will, um, they can turn it to the correct 
temperature setting that, the, that reads on the package and put the water in, now me mesh it around a little <laughs> bit, uh, make sure it, it gets all of the food heated up and then it's ready to eat. So that system isn't on Crew Dragon because it's really only for short destinations. Um, so MREs for now. Yeah, it sounds uh, very convenient with that small space inside of Dragon that they don't have to do all that cooking and, and rehydrating of their food. They can just pull out their food and uh, eat it right then and there. Yeah, and it also means you don't have to wait on everybody else to heat up their food before <laughs> no you get to heat up your food. So right. <laughs> everybody can eat dinner at the same time. <laughs> And a reminder, we are still in the phase burn. And a little under three minutes left. Dracos are looking good. Burn is proceeding nominally. It was a nine and a half minute burn. We are standing by for more information as we continue. This burn, as we said, will raise the apogee, the highest point of Dragon's orbit, to 10 kilometers lower than the International Space Station, that beautiful view on the right-hand side. We are just waiting on that phase burn to complete. It is about a nine minute burn and it should be closing here shortly in about a minute or so, but we'll wait for that call out and that confirmation. And everything we've heard so far is that the burn is proceeding nominally. All of the Dracos are performing well. The first of five major burns for the crew on their way to the International Space Station. International Space Station will be their home for the next six months. And a really interesting fact is this flight today makes Soichi Noguchi only the third person ever to fly on three different spacecraft. So he has flown on the, uh, the space shuttle, on a Russian Soyuz, and now Crew Dragon. And the only other two people who have done that are Wally Shira and John Young. So wow. he's joining a very select few with this milestone. It's amazing. We are still waiting for that phase burn confirmation. But we are getting some really awesome views of Earth. Yeah, that never gets old. I wonder what the crew members are thinking, especially Victor, if this is his first time, you know, in space, seeing the world in this uh, view here. That, that's incredible. Dragon SpaceX, nominal burn. Okay, we copy a uh, nominal burn and we'll be getting into 4.300 here uh, shortly. Copy getting into 4.300 shortly and we can confirm there will be no out of plane burn. Okay, copy that, uh, no out of plane burn. And there's that confirmation of that phase burn is complete and nominal. And the, uh, we won't be needing the out of plane burn either, which would be in case Crew Dragon needed its uh, journey adjusted just a little bit. So it sounds like they are on the right path as well. But yes, good confirmation of the phase burn, the first of five major burns as Crew Dragon makes its way to the International Space Station. So we, uh, we do have 27 hours and we would love to answer some of your questions on social media. So if you're curious about some aspect of today's crew mission, please submit your question with the hashtag AskNASA and we'll try our best to answer it. This first one comes from Nico who wants to know why it takes about 27 hours to reach the space station on this flight compared with about eight hours if we had launched yesterday. And I think the key word is phasing. Um, it, it really just depends on 
phasing, but <laughs> also it doesn't necessarily take Crew Dragon 27 hours to reach the International Space Station. It just takes long enough that our crew is going to need a sleep period in that time. So we had to factor in a sleep period. That way they are alert and cognizant and ready to uh, to step in in case anything needed to be done manually on the mission. So it is a bit longer, but we're here for the whole thing and you can join us. <laughs> Sounds very smart that they plan in sleep because I don't know if I, I was uh, <laughs> went all day, 24 hours trying to make it to the station and then trying to function. So I'm glad that uh, they'll get some rest in uh, during their trip there. Absolutely. Another good question, the Crew Dragon of the Crew-1 mission, is this a new capsule or is this the refurbished DM-2 vehicle? You want to take that? This is a brand new uh, vehicle for Crew-1. Um, we did not refurbish Demo-2 for this specific mission. Um, so it is a brand new capsule. It is the, these are the first uh, four astronauts that get to uh, fly on this vehicle. So it must be really exciting for them to get a to fly on not only a new uh, spacecraft, but a new vehicle itself as well. Absolutely, and very cool is that the Demo 2 vehicle, Endeavor, which is what Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley named it, mm -hmm. that will be the vehicle for Crew 2 coming up next year. And so I, I also learned that uh, it will keep its name, Endeavor. The new crew won't rename it moving forward, so that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, that actually is going to be a really exciting flight because we will also be refurbishing the first stage booster on today's flight for Crew 2 as well. As we get some more beautiful views from the International Space Station on the right-hand side, let's see, it's currently flying. It's actually about to enter an orbital sunset or an orbital nighttime, I should say. Uh, the International Space Station flies at 17,500 miles an hour, and so it's orbiting Earth, and it sees 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. So while it looks beautiful right now, it's uh, coming up toward Mexico, and we'll be entering the orbital nighttime. Dragon SpaceX for next burn. And go ahead for the next burn. Uh, stand by. Roger, standing by. But I was mentioning it's, uh, oh, and a, a really cool view right now. You can see the Cygnus resupply com or commercial resupply spacecraft on the International Space Station. Those two solar arrays that look like symbols makes it really easy to spot. And that actually brought up some of the science that Crew-1 is going to be working on while they're on the space station. We'll chat a little bit more about that later. Awesome. So we have another question here from NASA when or at NASA when do you when do you get to contact family when in space that's a good question and you know it's very fortunate the astronauts i've actually heard many say especially if they were in the military they were able to speak with their families more on the space station than they were you know, while deployed sometimes. And so they get the opportunity to FaceTime or I guess. And SpaceX from Dragon, Pursuit Dawn Steps. Dragon, SpaceX, go ahead. Hey Jay, uh, as we mentioned earlier, MS-1 and pilot are complete uh, with their suit doffing. Uh, we've completed 4.300 and Commander and MS-2 are going off umbilicals at this time to start the suit doffing. Copy, MS-1 pilot complete, and com Commander and MS-2 uh, are starting their suit offing now and complete with 4.300. And I'm ready for that burn. And I'm ready. Okay, yeah, go ahead and uh, give us the words on the burn. Okay, the boost burn is as scheduled, uh, currently showing 16.20.42 UTC. However, ahead of that time, we may or may not take additional phase burns or out of plate burns, but we're not currently, uh, you know, there's nothing uh, the vehicle's planning right now. Okay, we copy. So the next burn is currently that boost burn at 1620. Uh, however, there, there could be uh, some additional burns uh, in between, but nothing at this time. Correct, and we'll keep you posted if that changes. 
Dragon copies. Hey, uh, Jay, one last thing. Go ahead. Yeah, the view is beautiful. Outstanding. Yeah, it takes lot, take lots of pictures for us. And uh, also have some words for you from C. Okay, copy, and uh, we are ready for the words from CE. Yeah, Resilience, on behalf of SpaceX, thanks for flying Falcon and Dragon and uh, safe travels. And thanks, Han, to the entire uh, Falcon 9 team. Well done. That was one heck of a ride. There was a lot of smiles. I don't know if you could see on the video. Uh, but also to the SpaceX recovery and uh, launch teams and all of the NASA teams and DOD teams. You know, we wouldn't be up here in LEO without your support. Uh, making history is, is definitely hard, and you guys all made it look easy. And uh, again, congratulations to everyone. Resilience is in orbit. Thank you so much, and travel safely. Thank you. Some amazing words from the crew on board, and what you're looking at on your screen is actually live views from Dragon itself, from Resilience right now. So we are getting to see what the crew is seeing as well on board. And they did say it was beautiful, and I have to agree. <laughs> I don't know if there's ever a time you're flying over and it's not beautiful. Right. So it has to be a very interesting first flight for Victor, and getting to share it with people he's very close with is really cool, too. Right, I can't even imagine. <laughs> so uh, getting back to Rohan's question, when do you get to contact family when in space? Uh, as I mentioned, you, the astronauts do have scheduled times. They can video chat with their families. Uh, they also have a phone that which they can dial their families from up there. So uh, they, they get to talk with them pretty frequently, sometimes daily, uh, and I think maybe weekly for the video conferences. Yeah, it sounds really convenient and uh, probably something that they could really use while they're away for six months. Um, and it sounds like they'll get to video chat. Uh, at least they've gotten some practice with the pandemic uh, yeah. doing video chatting. Um, so hopefully they're used to it, but um, really amazing that they get to still communicate with their families back on Earth. Thinking the same thing. It's been very, very similar this year. You know, we're all getting a little taste <laughs> of what it's like to be an astronaut on a long duration a mission <laughs> and having to be just a little bit isolated, you know, in your own space for an extended period of time. And, and life just becomes much more virtual. And so I think we can understand just a little bit more what it's like to be in their shoes or their suits. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now again, the next milestone coming up is their crew meal. We are waiting for them to start their meal as they watch this amazing view. That's what you see on your screen. This is the view from Dragon, from Resilience. This is what the crew members get to see on their way to the International Space Station. Yeah, and they're still getting into their more comfortable clothes right now before we get into that meal. And I'm not sure what they're having for dinner, but I heard what they had for breakfast. And oh, it right. was, <laughs> sounded pretty delicious. Whether it was hungry. a medium rare steak, I heard, <laughs> uh, I think a medium burger, some curry. Right. I'm having a really easy time remembering all of these I know, things because I'm ready they for sound dinner. so good. <laughs> Again, we are waiting for the crew to finish getting out of their suits and getting comfortable and getting ready for their midday meal. Um, it's one of, they each get 12 meals while they're on this flight, or they each have 12 meals. Have 12 meals. I don't know if they'll need to eat 12 <laughs> meals on the way or in 27 hours. Um, I think I could do it, but <laughs> they also have some snacks. So they are well prepared mm -hmm. for their journey to the International Space Station. Um, and let's see, it's been a little over an hour from launch now. It's been an hour and seven minutes to be specific. So I think we have about 26 more to go <laughs> and they should be getting settled in, getting out of those suits and looking forward to dinner. 
and that that hour went by f so fast I feel like we we just lifted off <laughs> um, but yeah I'm like waiting for the crew to start their midday meal um, they are getting comfortable uh, inside of Dragon now that they're coasting uh, so out of their suits into some more comfortable clothes um, and they are going to be eating MREs which are meals ready to eat um, and as we mentioned earlier, they are meals that they don't have to rehydrate. They don't need to heat up. They could just pull them out and just start eating. And I wonder what that is. But um, a good reminder on the right side of your screen is Mission Control Hawthorne. And that's the teams that are uh, looking all over all of the Crew Dragon systems. We also have Mission Control Houston in Houston, Texas. And that's NASA's Mission Control Center. Uh, oh, and a good view of Mission Control Houston. Feels a little bit like home for me. <laughs> but uh, they will really come into play tomorrow once we begin joint operations as the Crew Dragon gets a little bit closer closer to the International Space Station, because then we have two vehicles in play. We've got the International Space Station, and we've got tr Crew Dragon. So um, our teams here are monitoring the International Space Station, teams in Hawthorne really still looking over Crew Dragon systems. Again, if you're just now joining us, we did have an on-time liftoff of our Crew One uh, mission today and now we are coasting on Dragon uh, we are waiting for the crew to start their midday meal as they are getting comfortable inside of Dragon right now as they coast towards the International Space Station yeah and just a little bit of a reminder if, you know it's been a little bit since we talked about who's on our crew we've got all of their mm -hmm. first names out there but uh, Victor Glover, he's the pilot of the spacecraft. This is his first space flight, and he was selected in 2013. And so his training takes a couple of years. Any astronaut training takes a couple of years. And um, he was officially an astronaut in 2015. He was, uh, he was also a commander in the U.S. Navy. So he was a naval aviator. He's a test pilot in the F-18 Hornet. Um, and he has he mentioned earlier in the video we watched about him all of the hours he had flying but this being the first time he'll get to go over a certain altitude and, right. and actually reach space so i know it's a huge milestone for him today yeah he knew that exact number that exact <laughs> height that he's reached so now he's reached new heights uh, i wonder what he's feeling right now <laughs> i can only imagine and it's been a little while since they ate i think i heard somebody mentioning joking about i hope they weren't too nervous but it's been a while i'm sure he's fine uh, Mike Hopkins is the commander of the spacecraft. He's sitting next to Victor. We are looking right to left. He's sitting on Victor's left, but our right of Victor. Uh, he was selected in 2009, and he has spent 166 days in space already aboard the International Space Station. So feels like home to him, I'm sure. He was part mm -hmm. of the Expedition 3738 crew. And he was a colonel in the U.S. Air Force as well. So those are our military folks aboard the spacecraft. We have Victor, who was in the Navy, and we have uh, Mike, who was in the Air Force. Yeah. And additionally, the Shannon Walker, she was selected in 2004. She's a Houston native, so she didn't really have to relocate to come work at Johnson Space Center. Uh, she holds a doctorate of philosophy in space physics which is incredibly impressive to me. Uh, and she began her career as a robotics flight controller for the International Space Station. So she was very familiar with the space station and then she actually lived there. She spent 163 days on station in 2010. She was part of Expedition 24 and 25. And I think it says something about, you know, we're 20 years on the space station now as of um, November 2nd and now we're on Expedition 64, so we've come quite a long way. And our, our next crew member is actually one of our international partners. He's with the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. That is Soichi Noguchi. He uh, apparently is the funniest one on the crew, <laughs> according to all of the crew members. And just from watching their videos together, I think I agree. He's, he's I pretty so funny. <laughs> he was selected as an astronaut in 1996, and uh, he's actually flown, as we mentioned, on the space shuttle. He flew on STS-114. 
And that was in 2005. He did three spacewalks then. And then he became the first Japanese astronaut to perform a spacewalk at the space station. So he's he's racking up the titles now. I know. Because he also flew uh, in 2010 on his expedition 2223 and spent 163 days in space then. That was aboard a Soyuz. And then today he's now flying on Crew Dragon. So he is now one of three people to have ever flown on three spacecraft. He's got a lot of experience. That sounds pretty amazing and pretty hard to do, I would assume. Well, let's take some more uh, social questions. Um, but if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer, please at NASA and, with an, and use the hashtag AskNASA. And uh, maybe we'll get to read your question and be able to answer it. So we've got one here. Um, how many different sections make up the ISS? Uh, well, it's very interesting. The ISS, or the International Space Station, if you're watching, this is kind of, it's not in flux by any means. It is complete, but we are seeing new pieces continuing to be added, like the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module. Um, that is, as it sounds, an expandable module attached to the International Space Station. And then um, we're also going to have a brand new airlock added. So the number continues to grow, but it's owned by I guess you could say, uh, different different countries around the world. It really mm. is international. You know, we have a European module, we have the U.S. modules, we have Russian modules, um, we have the Canada arm, and others I'm sure I'm forgetting. So it's, it's quite large. Um, it's actually the same interior volume of a Boeing 747. If you took all the seats out of a Boeing 747, <laughs> I think I could make myself comfortable. <laughs> And just sh goes to show you how important teamwork is, right? We have all these countries working together, and that makes up the International Space Station, which is incredible. And now we have more crew members, a diverse set of crew members, on their way to join the other astronauts on board the International Space Station. This next question, what is the difference between previous missions and the current mission, apart from the number of astronauts? So uh, as we saw earlier this year, DM2, actually DM stands for demonstration mission. So that was still a test flight. We had Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley live on the International Space Station for a couple of months. Um, but this time Crew Dragon is certified as a vehicle that can fly to and from the International Space Station. It's not a test anymore. This is the real deal for these four astronauts. Um, another, I think, very interesting thing is it is in relation to the number of astronauts, but this is the four, first ever four-person capsule. Right. So that's that's a pretty interesting difference in this mission. Right, and the, the capsule is made to have up to seven crew members, but this, this mission has four. Um, and also another difference between uh, Demo 2 and this mission um, is that they, the Bob and Doug actually had, because it was a test flight, they actually did have some uh, work to do while they were coasting to the International Space Station, whereas today the crew members are actually enjoying their ride um, most of the time all the way to the station since this is an official uh, commercial flight. So we've got another question. How many times has the Falcon 9 that was used today been launched? Well, this was a brand new first stage booster, so it's only been launched once um, and just an hour ago, about <laughs> a little over an hour ago. Um, but we are very excited that we are planning to use this same booster for Crew 2 next spring. Um, so that will be its second launch, but just to answer the question, this booster has only launched one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one, why do they stay up in the space station for six months? Well, we are looking to go to the moon and Mars. And the best place to test out what it's like to live for an extended period of time in low or in microgravity is here in low Earth orbit because it's very, it's much, I'm not going to say easy, it's never easy to get anywhere in space. But it's not as difficult to get to and from the space station as it would be to get to and from the moon or to and from Mars. And so living that long on the International Space Station gives us the opportunity to evaluate how astronauts' bodies adapt when they are in microgravity for that amount of time. Um, that helps us prepare for those long duration missions. Additionally, because they're very busy, they've got 
tons, hundreds of science experiments that they're working on at any one time. Over the past 20 years, we've completed over 3,000 science experiments aboard the International Space Station, and so many of them really benefit life on Earth. So they may be up there for a while, but it's all for a very good reason. Yeah, it sounds like a two for one. It, uh, it, if you're going to go out to Mars, that is a much longer journey, um, much harder to get back to Earth. So uh, I think these small, almost short sprints in comparison, even though it's six months, six months is a long time to us, um, it does make sense. It's, it's like training um, to get ready for these longer missions, right? And we're still just waiting for the crew members to have their dinner. Um, and as we mentioned, we're taking these Ask NASA questions. So if you have one, use that hashtag Ask NASA on Twitter. We'll be on the lookout. Another one, uh, what is the most crowded the International Space Station has ever been? And the number is 13. So we had six expedition crew members and then seven on a space shuttle docked to the International Space Station. And when our crew members arrive tomorrow, they will more than double the current uh, residents on the International Space Station. There are currently three people on board. We've got Sergei Kutsverchkov, Sergei Rizikov of the Roscosmos um, Russian Space Agency. We've got astronaut Kate Rubens on board. And so adding four tomorrow makes seven, which we have not had uh, seven long duration crew members on the International Space Station in quite a while. Seven doesn't sound too bad compared to 13, so hopefully they have enough space to be able to, um, you know, maneuver around uh, for the next six months. <laughs> We've got another social question. What's the new crew going to be working on for the next six months? Well, we talked about some of the science and some of the science, as we mentioned, happens on their bodies. Um, they take biological samples that are then compared to ones that were taken before they launched. Um, and then they're taken some more once they get back and that's all in comparison to how their body adapts uh, to microgravity. We heard someone speaking about tissue chips e earlier. They can, it's so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> it's totally beyond me, but um, you can put organs on chips and essentially it, it gives them a better idea, it gives scientists an easier look at how potential drugs uh, affect organs and, um, and also just helps us to develop things that may eventually heal or treat some of what we deal with on Earth. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing all like the updates uh, on some of these science experiments, especially the tissue chips one. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more about science uh, later because we have quite a list of just examples. But um, let's see this one. Will crew two arrive before crew one departs? And will there be any overlapping arrivals and departures? Oh, that's a really good question. So the timing is actually crew one should return prior to liftoff of crew two. That's uh, that's the schedule so far, but it might actually overlap um, when we do lift off crew two. So we don't have the exact schedule just yet. So we will have to wait to see um, when we announce those schedules. I think actually we will have a direct handover. Crew two will arrive at the International Space Station and then crew one will leave. Ah, so okay. we'll have two crew dragons on the space station Together. at one time. That'll be pretty cool. Yeah. This one, uh, do you have plans to take seven people in a dragon space capsule? You can talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> Well, Crew Dragon is uh, made and designed to carry up seven to carry up seven crew members. So there will be a time in the future to have um, a seven-member um, vehicle go up to the space station. But I believe Crew Two is actually going to be another four-person uh, crew flight. But it is designed to have up to seven crew members. So hopefully soon in the future. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um NASA doesn't have any current plans to expand from that four-person crew, but as you mentioned, Dragon can fly seven, so mm -hmm. we will have to see one day, um, maybe on commercial missions, what, what we do with putting seven people on board. Yeah.
This question from Ashley, what do the boost burns do? The boost burn comes tomorrow morning. Uh, we are trying to let the crew get some sleep and not awake them with any burns. Um, and so boost burn will raise their apogee, the highest point of their orbit, to 10 kilometers lower than the station. That'll be the second of those five major burns we talked about uh, propelling Crew Dragon toward the International Space Station. So that's the next burn we're looking forward to. We've just had the phase burn, everything looking well for Dragon. Um, and we will not have a burn until tomorrow morning. So quite a bit of time in between that we're gonna let the crew get a meal, get some sleep, and then wake up early tomorrow and get ready for their arrival to their new home on the space station. Right, and as you mentioned earlier, if they do uh, tread the course or go a little bit off course, they will use some extra phase burns if needed, but so far everything is looking good um, for that next burn being uh, the boost burn. We've got another question. Do the astronauts have some place in the dragon to sleep, or are they sleeping in their chairs? <laughs> they actually are sleeping in their chairs. Yeah. Um, they can take off those foot restraints and stow those, so that's an option. It also gives them a little more room to float around inside the capsule, mm -hmm. and it's a little more crowded this time with uh, four people. Four people <laughs> instead of just two, and so we have. Um, We'll have that opportunity. They also have some window covers that they can put up inside Crew Dragon because as we mentioned, they're going around the Earth every 90 minutes. Right. And that would really mess with your circadian rhythm if you couldn't get some good shut eye, some good darkness for that full time. And so instead of going in and out of sunlight every 45 minutes, they're gonna put up those window covers and hopefully feel like a real nighttime, get some real sleep. Yeah, and just as a reminder, these are custom seats for them. So they are made for each one of the crew members. So they should be pretty comfortable, uh, I would hope. Uh, so they should be able to get some good sleep knowing that they, they are custom fitted for each uh, crew member on board. So we have another question from John. How do they do laundry on the ISS? That's a really <laughs> great question. <laughs> I love this question because I wish the answer was true for me. Uh, the answer is they don't. They don't do laundry on the International Space Station. They uh, simply throw out their clothes. So, oh, wow. I know, so they can wear them a certain amount of times and they may choose to bring some back with them. Um, however, typically any older dirty clothes they can put on the uh, the commercial resupply vehicles that do not splash down or that just burn up in space so there's not really a trash can there's not a laundry machine on the space station they put them inside of those uh, those vehicles that burn up in the atmosphere and that takes care of that <laughs> so if you don't like doing laundry become an astronaut <laughs> yeah that's a great point I could do that <laughs> I've got one more question. What personal items can you take to the ISS? And you mentioned this earlier, uh, they can only take approved um, items with them. So what are the approved items uh, that NASA will allow the astronauts to bring with them? A lot of astronauts choose to bring photos and they'll put photos up because they have a very small, I guess you could call it bedroom, it's called crew quarters, um, but it's very small and they put the photos you know, on the walls, remind them of home, it's probably their family, their friends, um, and these are personal items, so we don't necessarily always know what it is, but I've also um, seen you know, pieces of jewelry or just special mementos to them that they wanna take to low Earth orbit and bring back. Um, so those are just a few of the things that they've taken before. And again, we are just waiting for the crew to begin their midday meal. Um, so far, we've had an on-time liftoff of our Crew-1 mission. Uh, the astronauts are on resilience right now, coasting along to the International Space Station. We did complete the phase burn. Um, in the
sleep. But being in microgravity is pretty exciting, so I don't know if I could sleep. Right. <laughs> so we'll be looking for them to have that meal, have a good eight hours of sleep before the next burn tomorrow morning, the boost burn. We are going to take a quick break, um, but we will be back. Uh, what you'll see on your screen is some uh, live uh, animation for where the crew is throughout their journey, uh, but we'll be right back. 